I invite you to read with me our text for today. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. The theme for our time together today is the road to riches. Now it does sound a bit like a game show, doesn't it? And while we laugh, I have to admit that it's not an easy topic to speak on and for several reasons for myself. Firstly, I carry with me an upbringing and my childhood experiences as I hear Jesus teach about money, about wealth and riches. There were times in our family when things were stable, but there were also times when I saw and when I felt the worries of my parents. And so my fear of scarcity and my need for security makes it difficult at times to live in trust and in generosity. And then secondly, what makes it difficult is that we are constantly bombarded by our culture to spend more, to consume more, to move upwards. Our imagination is shaped by what we see in advertisements and on social media. And then thirdly, I'm an amateur. When it comes to micro and macroeconomics, to the increases of economic systems and policies. The challenge for us is to learn from contemporary perspectives and to discern how to live it out in ways that honor God and his dream for our world. And maybe you have some of your own thoughts and feelings that arise. Now, isn't it curious that in a time where we are often asked how we feel about things, it's so difficult to talk about money, to talk about wealth. A friend writes how before a church board budget meeting, they were invited to reflect and share their answers to this question. What has been your happiest and saddest experience with money? How would you answer it? And maybe you want to reflect on it more this week. And as you hold these memories in your heart now, let us explore Jesus' teaching together. So what do you do when you have something important to say to your children? We say, look at me, give me your eyes. They listen with their ears, but we want their eyes. And this is what Jesus does. He's surrounded by a large crowd people wanting things from him to be cured. But he searches out for his disciples. And then he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Let's stay with the words kingdom of God. When Jesus starts his public life, he announces that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is coming. He is saying the king is coming. And with a new king or a CEO or a coach, you know, they bring different values, different priorities and ways of doing things. And he puts into focus a clear decision each one of us has. And that is that we have to choose a master. There are two opposing kingdoms, each with their own pull, and Jesus states this unequivocally in Matthew 6, verse 24, when he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jacques Ilal writes that Jesus regards money not as a neutral object, but as a power which tries to be like God, which makes itself our master and which has specific goal. 
Jesus gives wealth the status of an opposing God. And it's always a choice between the two. Now the theme of money and of wealth is prevalent throughout the book of Luke. You'll remember that in chapter 18, we read of a rich young ruler who had to choose. And he comes to Jesus asking what he should do to inherit eternal life. He confidently tells Jesus that he has kept all of God's commandments. And then Jesus puts in front of him his choice. He says, you lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus offers him an opportunity of a lifetime to move from being a member of the crowd, intrigued by his words and trying to get something from him to become his follower, to choose Jesus as his master. But saddened because of his great wealth, this rich young ruler walks away. And he experienced the words of Luke 1 verse 53, which says, He, Jesus, has filled the hungry with good things, and he sent the rich away empty. Instead of controlling his possessions, his possessions possesses him. His wealth is his master. And maybe later on in his life, as he heard that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was crucified and resurrected, I wonder if he mourned his decision. Because even if he had wealth and his morality intact, he felt something was missing. The deepest hunger of the human heart cannot be satisfied with wealth. It oversells what it can give. It leaves us feeling disillusioned, cheated, empty, and alone. And this is what Jesus warns us against when he says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Now, when you hear the word rich, I wonder, do you include yourself into that list? My hunch is probably no. We often think the rich are those who have more. It's others. We, beh we hide behind the term, I'm middle class. But let me ask us this. When you are sad or down or stressed or anxious, what do you turn to? Do you have the means to buy some comfort, whether in food or drink or things, experiences, distractions? When Jesus says, woe, he's not condemning us. He's warning us against the reality of this opposing kingdom. He's pointing us to the reality that the comfort of wealth, it will run out. It's out of his concern and love for us. It's like when I warn our four-year-old not to touch a warm stove. I'm not saying that my love for you is dependent on whether you do this or not. I want to keep her from unnecessary pain, from unnecessary anguish. Now the choice of who our master is, is one that we return to again and again. And if you decide to choose God as our master, our next question could be, how do we then enter into the kingdom of God? Jesus addresses this after the young ruler turns away. He says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some Bible interpreters have gone to great lengths to try and explain what this means. Some have explained it away by saying the needle of the eye refers to a small opening in a city wall. And that though it's difficult, a camel can enter through. But the simple truth is that Jesus is saying something much simpler, simply that a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. One of the challenges for we who have, who are rich, is that like the rich young ruler, we are used to being in control. We are used to our understanding of how the world works. That if I just try harder, if I just do better, 
then you get somewhere. And we bring that to our relationship with God. We think, if I can just try harder, if I turn over a new leaf, I can save myself. I can be healed. But the poor, however, they do not have this attitude. And that is why the kingdom of God is theirs. They have nothing of value to offer. They do not have the skills or the knowledge or the influence to get up under from their condition. And this is the posture required for us, for the kingdom of God, to become the poor, the poor in spirit. And so the poor offers us a gift. They hold up a mirror for us. When we see the poor in ragged, torn clothes, I see the condition of my soul. All have fallen short. When you look at the eye of a needle with your naked eye, it looks flawless, it looks perfect. But put under a microscope, you see its ragged edges, you see its flaws, you see that all have fallen short. We are all in need of a savior. And so when Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God, obviously his disciples is startled and they ask who then can be saved? And Jesus answers, what's impossible with man is possible with God. When we choose God, we are also called not to trust our efforts, but to trust the master. Remember Jesus looking at his disciples before he spoke? Maybe the other reason he looked at them was to make sure, yes, that they hear him, but also to read their reaction. And what might he have seen? Shock, doubt, unbelief? Jesus looks them in the eye and invites them, invites us, trust me. And maybe you've seen this with your own children when they are trying out something new. Take, for example, the acrobranch craze at the moment. You know, we use it from one tree platform to the next. Now, your kid might be very excited to put on the gear, to get onto line. And, but when it's their turn, they can throw. They, they froze, afraid. And then what you don't do is you don't say, just get up. Everyone is waiting. Just go. Do you know how much money this cost me? No. You look at them in their eyes. You help them to center and you encourage them with, I have you, you are safe. And when it comes to our money and our wealth, worry is often the word that describes our experience with it. The poor might worry about how to get hold of it. The rich, how to hold on to it. But Jesus invites us to trust him. Listen to his words from Matthew 6. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. What I'm trying you to do is to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. And this is a journey, hey, to move from worry to trust, to look in the eyes of God and trust. And isn't this a wonderful description of prayer, of bringing myself to rest with God? As Psalm 131 says, I've learned to quiet my soul. I sit with God, looking at God, looking at me lovingly, putting me at ease that he has us. Now, imagination about wealth needs an upgrade. We are going to have to return to the gospels again and again to learn from the master, to follow him and to trust him. Jesus speaks more about money and wealth than on any other topic we learn how to trust him. Martin Luther was the first to say that we need three conversions. The conversions of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the purse. So having chosen God, having trust Jesus, 
What do we do then with our money, with our wealth? What do we do with what we have? If Jesus invites the rich young ruler and us to follow him, where are, he go- where are we going? Philippians 2 verse 5 and 8 is one of the oldest hymns of the church and it points the direction of Jesus. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of him that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity, took on the status of a slave. He became human, and having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Again, when we think of the two opposing masters, what's the word you would use to describe money or wealth? Probably up, more, getting, clinging on. But when we listen to Philippians and when we watch Jesus through the gospel, we see Jesus moving in a different direction. It's the call to follow the master downwards. Jesus, who's equal with God, empties himself. He becomes a slave. His direction is down, is to giving, is to serving. Henry Nouwen perfectly contrasts the direction of the prevailing culture and that of the call of Jesus when he writes, my whole life I have been surrounded by well-meaning encouragement to go higher up. And the most used argument was you can do so much good there for so many people, but these voices calling me to upward mobility are completely absent from the gospel. We work against the power that money and wealth tries to have on us by moving down with Jesus. So then how do we do it? Maybe three ways. Firstly, by giving where you are. Now some have said that it means for us to be blessed, we have to become poor ourselves. But then what would your motivation be for that? One could be fear the fear of having anything or enjoying anything. But that is counter to the message of the Bible. Perfect love drives away all fear. Or your motivation could be that of pride, that if I give everything away, I am a truer follower of Christ than those comfortable ones. And again in the Bible, we read that God resists the proud. Pride is another way of trusting not the master, but on ourself. Now, when Jesus tells the rich young ruler to sell everything and give it to the poor, he's not laying down a general commandment for everyone. It's a specific word to a specific person in a specific situation. Zacchaeus turns to Jesus, says he will repay everyone. He will give away 50% of what he has. Nicodemus, also a rich man, he doesn't offer anything and he's still accepted. When we follow Jesus downward, The place to start is our own families. Breadwinners have a responsibility to ensure that those who are dependent on us, that they feel adequately secure. Paul writes about this in 1 Timothy when he says, whoever does not provide for relatives and especially for family members has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And we see this in Jesus as he is dying on the cross. He looks at his mother and as a disciple, and he says, Women, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. Secondly, we follow the master downward in giving what we can. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 and 8 puts it like this. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in, um, in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We give not out of compulsion, but out of cheer. Jesus rightfully said that it's more joyful to give than it is to receive. 
And as you were holding on to your happiest experiences with money, my hunch is that for many of us, we experienced this when we used money to give to others. Now, what often makes it difficult for us to give cheerfully is that we don't have margin in our life, not in our diaries and not in our budgets. And in asking God to give us our daily bread, the prayer Jesus taught us, we are going to have to ask God to help us discern between bread, what we need and wants. And it's going to look different for each one of us. It might mean for me that when I can upgrade, should I? Could I rather use this margin and experience the joy of giving? Can I say no to some activities in my life so that I'm able to slow down and to see those in need and meet their need with a loving deed? So when we give, it's not out of compulsion, but it's from a deep gratitude of all that I have is a blessing of God. And then thirdly, we follow the master downward in giving to the poor. In Luke 4, we read of Jesus being in the synagogue and he's giving the scroll of Isaiah the prophet and he reads from it. He's, he reads, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he says, today the scripture is filled in my hearing. Jesus again and again can be found at the people culture moved to the fringes. Jesus with the sick, the outcast, those who don't have, the poor. In his incarnation, Jesus becomes human. He moves into our mess. He brings good news. Now, a central verse for us as a congregation, as we discern how to steward what God gives us, is found in Galatians 2 verse 10, and it reads the following. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor. Now, it's a challenging verse, but as we set our budget and our goals, we are called to remember the poor. And one area we feel called to as a church is to help school-going children with meals. We want to join God in bringing about justice. It's not right that children try to concentrate and learn with their bellies empty. And maybe you'd like to consider to partner with us. Our reach and our impact is further together than by ourselves. Derek Webb sings that poverty is hard to see when it's only on your TV and not 20 miles from across town. Now in South Africa, we do not have to travel far to see poverty around us. And to be sure, at times it can feel overwhelming. There's so many needs. But in following Jesus, we ask, Lord, help me to see, help me to respond in love where I can. Proverbs 11 says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And so we ask, Lord, expand my heart. When we create margin in our calendar and budget, we follow Jesus downward. We come alongside those who don't have. And you know what? So often those who don't have offer us so many gifts. A few years ago, I joined an outreach to Mozambique and to be with people, to work alongside them as we were building a training facility. And as we worked, and we worked hard, I found myself working alongside another man and he shared something of his family, of his joys, his dreams, his hopes. And I wondered, is there something that I can help with? And I asked Gerard, the missions leader, whether it would be wise and the community offered their time and their work as a gift. And I wanted to honor that. So Gerard wisely invited me to have a conversation with the person, to listen, and then to offer it as a gift. And so in broken English, his and mine, I told this man that his love for his family, for his people touched me. And I would like to give him something 
and I gave him some money. And you know what happened next? He asked me to wait and he ran to his house. He fetched one of his chickens and gave it to me. I wanted to refuse. But Herod encouraged me, accept the gift. And in doing so, I experienced the joy of giving. And so my Mozambican friend as well. Those who don't have often teach us so much about generosity and joy and contentment and hope. And our wealth extends beyond our money. We have skills and talents and networks that we can share. God has blessed us with so much. And part of this blessing is to, to have faith. The poor extends to those who also are poor in spirit, those who are searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. And can we go to them and listen and share something of the bread we have found in God? And a first step might be to invite them to worship with us, here online or maybe in person. Research has shown that a quarter of our friends will join us if we were only to invite them. Friends, may we continue to choose God, to trust Jesus as our master and follow him to the broken places of the world. Let us pray together. God, thank you for your word that is a light onto our path, always drawing us deeper into this life with you. Lord, you know our thoughts and emotion when it comes to what we have and the choices before us. Lord, and we ask for the grace to put our trust in you. Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes to the condition of our soul, of our need for you. Lord, and as we trust you, help us to follow you downward. Lord, expand our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the blessing of God. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the presence of his Holy Spirit is with you. Amen.